Hi, and welcome to the fourth developmental session in our series, Conversation Analysis and Healthcare Interactions. Today, we will be examining turn-taking. And before we begin, here are the articles we will be using for the session. In this session, we're going to take a look at some of the key features in the practice of turn-taking during social interactions. By the end of the session, you should be able to identify some key components relating to concepts of turn construction and transition relevance. You should be able to use these components to locate possibly complete units within a given turn at talk. And you'll be able to describe a practice of next speaker selection in the context of paediatric primary care. During our developmental session, we'll have a discussion round to address each of our key questions. During these rounds, you'll all have the opportunity to contribute thoughts, observations or questions. And in this respect, all participation is welcome and encouraged, but always voluntary. Skipping your turn will always remain valid. And don't forget, having the PDFs open at this stage will be helpful. Before we go on, let's briefly look at what we covered in the last session. We examined the key components in designing turns at talk. We identified some of these components in the design of treatment recommendations within primary care. And we discussed the implications of multiple treatment strategies within a context of primary care. Today, we're going to look at the concept of turn-taking. Turn-taking might be considered as conversational traffic management, and with good reason, turn-taking is a highly organised activity and it has substantial social order. You could think of this traffic management as a speech exchange system, and this system is something that is empirically identifiable in everyday and institutional interactions. In some settings, these systems are pretty well defined and in some cases formalised. Ceremonies, debates and interviews all place system-derived constraints relating to who talks and when. Also, it places constraints upon the kind of things that people can say and for how long they can keep the conversational floor. While everyday interactions lack a formal speech exchange system, as we are learning, these interactions are still highly organised, particularly when it comes to the management of turn-taking. And this leads us to the question, how is turn-taking managed in everyday interaction? In order to address this question, we need to first look at two concepts taken from the pioneering work of Sachs, Jefferson and Shegloff. The first concept relates to how turns are taken during interaction sequences. In everyday settings, interactions typically unfold with speakers taking turns one at a time, with the exception of choral actions such as singing, laughing or co-completions of turns. Interactions involve regular changes of speaker, with the conversational floor shared in a stepwise manner from one participant to another. While the size of turn can vary, these turns are typically short. During these exchanges, participants work to minimise overlapping talk and minimise gaps between turns. This might be considered as tricky as it needs mutual precise coordination from all participants. And importantly, understanding turn-taking is fundamental to the understanding of conversation analysis. The next concept in the management of turn-taking is that of turn allocation. This relates to the activity of selecting who speaks next, which is in itself highly ordered across three distinct options. The current speaker can select the next speaker through an address term, an embodied action 
such as a glance or a gesture, or the selection can be tacit and understood from the prior turns. If the selected speaker passes on their turn, the next speaker can self-select to initiate a turn to a de facto open floor. If nobody self-selects, the current speaker may continue. And in this system, passing on a turn can be heard as a beat of silence, just long enough that the speakers can orient to the possibility that the opportunity to take a turn has been passed. And it's worth noting that in conversations, this process takes place at every transition point of a turn. So, now we have an idea of what happens, we can return to our question, how is turn taking managed? And this is a big question. The short answer is that turn taking is managed very well. We are able to carry conversations with minimal gaps and minimal overlaps, which means we must have methods we use to anticipate when someone's turn is likely to end. And it's not like people typically announce that they have finished speaking. The ways that turns are managed relate to both turn construction and transition relevance. With turn construction comes the concept of the turn constructional unit or TCU. This is a unit of talk that can be described as possibly complete. Now I say possibly complete because a fully complete turn at talk can comprise one or several TCUs. And it's in the construction that we can get an indication as to the possible completion points. These possible completion points are called transition relevance places or TRP. This is where there is a possibility for a change in speaker, although the presence of a TRP does not guarantee that this change will actually take place. Nevertheless, there are multiple practices that can serve to foreshadow that a turn is winding down and therefore project an incoming TRP. The first two I'll outline are syntax and prosody. Syntax is the most intuitive indicator. The completion of sentences, phrases, clauses, interjections, and so on. It's therefore interesting to note that syntax alone is ineffective in projecting the TRP. The example below illustrates two turns at talk with multiple completion points based on syntax alone. Yet, the recipient only contributes at the appropriate turn completion point. This is where prosody comes in. The cues that can be discerned in or around the TRP. This relates to what might be described as the music of talk. This relates to changes in intonation, tempo and volume. These prosodic cues can be identified in the final unit of a turn, such as an upward or downward change in pitch at the end of a turn. However, there are prosodic cues that signal the end of a turn a little earlier, and pitch peak is one of those cues. This is evident when there's a particular emphasis and elongation on a particular unit of talk. This emphasis can signal that a turn is ending and can project an upcoming TRP. The example here shows the pitch peak arriving on line 3, and it's projected so well that B initiates their turn in slight overlap on line 4. Now, in addition to syntax and prosody, there is a further cue to the completion of a turn, and this relates to its pragmatic completion. This attends to the question of whether or not the turn is hearable in doing what it set out to do. For example, did it answer the question? Did it convey the information? Did it tell the story? Identification of pragmatic completion requires mutual monitoring 
to determine an unfolding action. As I have mentioned in an earlier session, a turn at talk can rely on prior turns to varying degrees to be understood as meaningful, and I'll expand upon this to say that turns at talk rely on priors to be understood as meaningfully complete. For example, to the store. Can this be considered as pragmatically complete? The answer is yes, if the turn followed a prior turn such as, where are you going? In CA terms, this would be a straightforward adjacency pair, a question response sequence. So, now we have some idea of how participants manage turn taking so well. We'll now turn to situations where turn taking is suspended or circumvented. When someone tells a story, this activity all but suspends the norms of turn taking. This is a topic we'll be covering later in our series. For now, in this example, K projects an incoming story on line one. I want to draw your attention to the a uh on this line, which is a filled pause. This projects the intent to continue. As does the content of this turn, it was like the other day, which can be considered to be a story preface. With this turn, K is granted license to multiple turns at talk. However, the recipient is not passive in this activity. These turns of mm -hmm on lines four and seven are interactive. These acknowledge each particle of the story and enable progress in this activity. This is a great example of the greasy parts of the machinery at work. Now we're going to look at some of the ways to get around the turn-taking system. As I've noted, syntax, prosody and pragmatics can converge to project turn completion and as such, the TRP. Even with this system, there are practices that participants can use so that they can retain the conversational floor for longer. These practices serve to circumvent the TRP and they are used by speakers as they work to retain the conversational floor. The rush through is an example of a practice employed to retain the conversational floor where a TRP might have otherwise been projected. The rush through compresses or eliminates the TRP as speakers quite literally rush through into another TCU. The example below includes a rush through on line three. There was a possible TRP at the word remember. Instead, Prue increases tempo at this point, rushing through the rest of the turn. The rushing is indicated by the chevrons that show that this speech has been compressed or rushed. While the rush through can suppress a possible TRP, another practice involves the timing of the next turn in a way that eliminates the normative transition space at the end of a turn. In this example, there was a possible completion point at out there on line eight. This is projected by the pitch peak and downward intonation. Kurt then abruptly tags on the question while contracting does to z as in z Keegan still go out. The final practice I want to outline for the retention of the floor is the concept of the pivot. A pivot is a unit of talk that bridges two turn constructional units. Constructional pivots are items that can serve as the end of one TCU and the start of the next, and these effectively blur the boundaries of each TCU, making it next to impossible to catch a TRP opportunity. In the example here, oh, that's what I'd like to have is a fresh one. 
the text highlighted in yellow is the pivot point. This serves as the end of a TCU, or that's what I'd like to have, and the start of a TCU, what I'd like to have as a fresh one. Modular pivots are items that can be normatively inserted at the start or end of a turn constructional unit. Address terms are common examples of a modular pivot, and you'll see this happen in a lot of media interviews and within political discourse. In the example here, the modular pivot is highlighted in yellow and is an address term. It can serve as the end of the TCU, you don't look at Gen, as well as the start of a TCU, Gen, I must be honest. So, now we have examined some of the basics of turn-taking. Let's take a look at a turn-taking practice in healthcare interactions. This study by Tanya Stivers examines next speaker selection during the problem presentation phase of pediatric primary care consultations. In the consultations, the children are in attendance with an adult carer, usually a parent. The study noted that doctors mainly select the child to present the problem. However, adult carers are mainly the ones who present the child's problem. This was, however, a pro-social action. The analysis showed that before taking their turn, adults first oriented to the child's primary right to respond before they initiated their response to the doctor. In this, the practice of the adult presenting the problem was seen to be the result of an interactive negotiation and not domination or control. So first, we're going to take a look at an example where the doctor appears to select the adults to present the problem. However, at this point, I'd like you to consider an alternative reading for this turn design, considering it is in the context of pediatric primary care. What is noteworthy is that both the adults initiate their turns only after a substantial gap of one and a half seconds. Upon this collision of turns, both adults drop out, only for one of them to continue one second later. This excerpt shows an interactive negotiation between the adults relating to who has primary rights to present the problem to the doctor. So now we're going to take a look at a couple of examples where the doctor explicitly selects the child patient as the next speaker, and the adult subsequently provides the problem presentation. In this example, the analysis shows that the doctor has selected the child to speak on line one. While the adult responds, this can be seen as the product of a negotiation with the child. Although it's not transcribed, the child effectively passes on their turn through the process of a mutual gaze to the adult early on in line three. This gaze converges with the adult's discourse particle, um, followed by a micro pause and another build pause. And it's then that the adult presents the problem. In this example, the analysis shows that the doctor has selected the child through a series of explicit address terms leading to the question on lines 15 to 16. Once again, it is the adult who presents the problem. Like before, this is also a product of interaction and negotiation. It's only after a substantial delay of 1.4 seconds does the adult initiate. This 1.4 seconds may not seem substantial, but in conversation terms, participants can identify gaps in speech that are as short as around half a second. In holding off, the adult has oriented to the child's primary rights to the conversational floor and has only initiated their turn 
as the child had evidently passed on this right to respond. And with that, here are the key questions that we will address in our upcoming developmental session. Thanks for watching.